Mexican citizens will choose their next president this summer. This week, the Korean International takes a closer look at the issues the candidates face. Not only do Mexico and the United States share a border, but they are also critical allies as conflicts over immigration and trade policy emerge between the two countries. We talked to an expert about what the implications could be in July's election. Women across Mexico are demanding the candidates to take a stand against femicide. We spoke to one group who advocates for victims of violence. The Current International starts now. Campaign season is up and running. Welcome to The Current International, I'm Claudia Buccio, and tonight we'll be exploring the upcoming elections in Mexico. Mexicans will take the polls on July 1st to elect their next president. They will also be voting for representatives, senators, and a couple governors. The U.S. and Mexico have a long history of social, economic, and political ties, so the stakes on both sides of the border are high. Let's send it over to reporter Dan Toomey, who will tell us more about the candidates running for president. Dan? Claudia, thank you so much. Now, there are four candidates who have formally announced their run for the presidency. The frontrunner is Andres Manuel López Obrador, also known as AMLO. He is the former mayor of the state of Mexico City and the favorite to win. He's leading at 42.5 percent, according to a poll tracker from Bloomberg News. This is the third time AMLO has run for president. He lost by narrow margins in both 2006 and 2012, leading to protests which he spearheaded. The count was so close he claimed to be the legitimate president. Now, this year, AMLO is campaigning with an anti-corruption message. AMLO has pledged to make peace among uh, warring drug cartels and expand the safety net for low-income families, as well as take a hard look at foreign investments in Mexico. A critic of President Donald Trump, AMLO says he would create a human wall at the Mexican border if Trump builds one on his own. Now, up next, we have Ricardo Anaya Cortez. Is, he is a Mexican attorney. Uh, the Bloomberg poll has him at second place. Now, Anaya is a member of the Conservative National Party, or PAN. It has partnered with the left-leaning Democratic Revolution Party to form a coalition under which Anaya is running. As a candidate, he supports small government and privatization and is now targeting the more millennial voting. In March, he visited Los Angeles to rally voters living overseas and voiced his support for young people known as Dreamers who were brought to the United States illegally as children. So up next, in third place, we have Jose Antonio Meade. Now he is in third place according to the, Broom, uh, to the Bloomberg projected polls. He served in the current government under the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI. This was in power in Mexico for the past 70 years. Meade appeals, uh, appeals to the business community. His platform also includes inc increased attacks on the finances of drug cartels, higher salaries for teachers, and a pledge to fix issues plaguing the PRI. And Margarita Zavala is the final and trailing candidate. She's a Mexican lawyer and politician married to former President Felipe Calderon. Zavala is the only candidate running as an independent, despite having served numerous roles in the past for the National Action Party. She's proposed to increase minimum wage, grow Mexico's police force, and fight corruption. Although she appears to have a very slim chance of winning, she hopes to have the upper hand with female voters. Now, if the polls hold up how they look right now, Obrador looks like to, he's going to be the winner. His outsider image appeals to Mexican citizens tired of government scandals and drug gang violence. His populist message seems to be resonating with many citizens. Where a victory will place Mexico with the Trump administration is too hard to tell. Thanks, Dan. We're only 86 days away from finding out who will become the next president of Mexico. One thing we do know is that Mexicans are fed up with the current president. According to a recent poll, 76% of Mexicans disapprove the work of Enrique Peña Nieto, the current president. Voters are ready for change, but the fight for the presidency in 2018 is more complex than it seems. Las doctrinas políticas en 2018 han pasado a segundo plan. La importancia es por obtener el poder y derrotar al sistema. Eso es lo que dice López Obrador, es lo que dice Anaya y es lo que dice Margarita Zavala. Y en medio de todo ello, el ciudadano mexicano está más confundido que nunca antes en la historia de unas elecciones presidenciales que yo haya visto. 
Frustration among the Mexican electorate has been building up for years. Because of Mexico's fear for authoritarian leaders, the Constitution states that no president can serve a second term. However, the same political party, PRI, ruled for 71 years between 1929 and 2000. From 2000 to 2012, El Partido de Acción Nacional, the National Action Party, also known as PAN, was in control of the presidency. That changed when Enrique Peña Nieto was elected and brought back the PRI party. Voters' unhappiness is opening a window of opportunity for López Obrador, who is running for the third time with a party that has never held a presidential position. El sistema de partidos en México ha colapsado. Esta es la última elección y así lo demuestra. Van todos los partidos coaligados, no va ninguno por sí mismo. Dos, pudieron hacer a un lado las diferencias ideológicas. La doctrina no cuenta tanto como el deseo de arribar al poder y ocupar los cargos públicos y desplazar al PRI. It is still early in the race to determine which candidate will win these elections. The first of three presidential debates is scheduled on April 22nd. The United States is a critical ally and partner for Mexico. But since U.S. President Donald Trump took office in 2017, the two nations have been frequently caught in tense disagreements, largely over issues related to immigration and trade. That's continued into this week after the Department of Homeland Security announced that the U.S. would deploy troops to the Mexican border in anticipation of a wave of spring migration caravans coming from Central America. Here's DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen on Wednesday. I've been in touch with my counterparts in Mexico uh, regarding this action. They understand the administration's desire, much like their own, to control illegal entry into our country. I value their partnership and do not expect this operation to affect that relationship. But while the U.S. has made the case that Mexico has been extremely cooperative, Mexican diplomats in the U.S. have pushed back publicly, suggesting that a deployment of troops is overreactive and the caravans are a yearly phenomenon. On Twitter, the Mexican Secretary of Exterior Relations tweeted this press release, emphasizing that it understands the U.S. deployment to be in a supportive capacity, but said any further militarization of the border would, quote, seriously damage the bilateral relationship. They also retweeted this appearance by Ambassador Hieronimo Gutierrez on CNN. The Mexican government has formally asked for clarification of the president's statements, both through the State Department and the Homeland Security Department. Uh, it's certainly not something that uh, the Mexican government welcomes, but as soon as we have further clarification, we can um, expect to have uh, a better uh, idea of where we are. Now, analysts say that these recent events are unlikely to test relations between the two countries more than they've already been tested. And by now, the Mexican government has gotten used to tuning out President Trump's aggressive rhetoric. Nothing new. That's the whole thing is that that's what I'm trying to say is that the power of these symbolic gestures goes down over time when they don't really turn into substantive policy changes. Diplomatically, they issued a bunch of statements, the ambassador issued statements, there's a bunch of editorials and the Mexican press, there, there's a flap about it. But all it really is is a flap because they know that substantively not much is going to be different. Turning back towards the election, some candidates have proclaimed that they'll push back uh, against the United States. But Meade says that once a new president is in office, they'll find that they'll have no other option but to work with the United States. And because of this, he believes Mexican-U.S. relations are unlikely to sour. There's a lot of shouting back and forth. But the reality is Mexico is the third largest trading partner of the United States. Uh, and there's huge interests below the political class in terms of the integration of our two economies, to say nothing about all the family and social and cultural relationships between the two countries that are just far more important and kind of dwarf the, the political fainting uh, back and forth between uh, political actors on both sides. Now, Mead briefly mentioned economic cooperation there. The U.S. is Mexico's largest trading partner, and Mexico is third for the United States. And the two countries and Canada are currently renegotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement, and that new treaty is expected in the coming weeks. We have more now on another pressing issue in the election. Tara? 
Thanks, Ryan. Mexico can be a dangerous place for women. A report from Mexico's Interior Department, the country's National Women's Institute, and the UN Women Agency said there have been more than 52,000 cases of femicide since 1985. Nearly one third of these femicides have taken place in the last six years. The UN Women Agency defines femicide as the killing of women and girls as a result of domestic violence or other forms of gender based discrimination. Some critics say the figure could be much higher in Mexico. I spoke with one mother who used her daughter's death to fight for change within the country. Norma Andrade said goodbye to her daughter Lilia on February of 2001 as she left their family home. She did not know this would be the last time she would see her daughter alive again. Ten days later, Lilia's body was found in Ciudad Juarez with signs of physical and sexual abuse. She is one of hundreds of Mexican women who have disappeared and have been killed since the 90s in the city of Juarez. Andrade's anger over her daughter's murder sparked her to create Nuestra Hijas de Regreso a Casa, an organization dedicated to providing support and legal justice for the families of those women. Lamentablemente, México todavía sigue viendo a las mujeres como de su propiedad, nos ven como un objeto sexual. ¿Qué sería lo ideal? Que el candidato que entrara, entrara con una visión de género, con una cultura en donde se respetara a la mujer. Yo debo de enseñarle a, a mi hija a cuidarse para que cuando salga no vaya a ser violada, en lugar de enseñar a los hombres a respetar a las mujeres y no violar. But what causes these gendered murders? Dr. Carol Ann Peterson, an expert in violence against women and women's rights, believes the trend of femicide is spurred by a culture of impunity, where crimes against women are not further investigated or prosecuted. Most of our society, whether it's the United States or foreign countries, have looked at the concept that men rule. Uh, patriarchal societies look at the sense that men make decisions and make the laws, and it's been over centuries that women were supposed to follow those rules and regulations, even though they had no voice. In 2007, the law on women's access to a life free of violence included femicide in its identification of violence against women, criminalizing it in the process. But due to lack of effective implementation, the killings continue, with at least seven women victims of gender-related murders every day in 2016, according to the UN Women Agency. With the Mexico election right around the corner, mothers like Andrade are challenging candidates to stand up and fight against these homicides by promoting equality and empowerment for women nationwide. And to set the example, if I murder you simply because you're female, what is the message I send to other women within my community who might think of doing something about it? Uh, and it takes a lot of brave women who are willing to literally put their lives on the line to stand up and say something. Andrade hopes for the safety of the nation's daughters in the future. It was me. Andrade and other activists in Mexico are pushing for greater recognition of violence against women by the international community. Ryan Thompson has more now on a new initiative in this year's election. Thanks, Tara. More than 60 media organizations are participating in an initiative to combat fake news surrounding this year's election in Mexico. Verificado 2018 was launched at the beginning of the Mexican electoral process and aims to not only disapprove fake news, but also prove truthful content to the public. Some of the media outlets that are participating include AJ+, Espanol, HuffPost Mexico, and BuzzFeed News and Twitter. La mayoría de las personas, el 90% del tiempo en internet lo utilizan en, en redes sociales. Siempre una noticia falsa tiene mucho mayor impacto, mucho mayor viralización que su verificación. Si creemos que las fake news nada más pueden eh, atacar a las personas con bajo nivel educativo o mal preparadas, estamos equivocados. Tenemos presidentes y expresidentes tuitando noticias falsas. Y eso es justamente lo que no queremos. Now, Hervicado has already disputed the truthfulness of multiple fake news articles, including one that said candidate Jose Antonio Meade admitted that he would buy the elections. You can find out more at verificado.mx. Thanks, Ryan. The Current International returns in two weeks with our final edition of the season. Get in touch with us on Facebook and Twitter and tell us what global stories you would like to learn more about. Until then, I'm Claudia Buccio, and on behalf of everyone here at Annenberg Media, good evening.